Hello, 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 everybody. Let me know if you can hear me, because we are close to going live. Just over a minute away. Can you feel the anticipation? Checking the chat. All right, let's see. Let me know you can hear me loud and clear. Thank you for that, Stuart. And hi, Anne, Rolf, Dieter, Tracy. Thank you, Rolf. All right, we got 54 seconds to go. So I hope you guys are ready. I see Bruce is in the house. Philip Alistair, good to see you guys. We're starting in 42 seconds. Stuart Braithwaite from New Zealand. Kia ora, good to see you there. Hannah, glad you could join us again live. John Oswell, good to see you there. Stan, Warren D, Rayel. All right. And we are from uh, another hot day in Perth, huh? Australia. All right, 20 seconds to go, guys. Susan, good to see you. Philip. All right, get ready for the timer. Here we go. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. <laughs> And hello, everybody. Welcome to LFL episode number 90. I'm glad you could join us. I see we've got lots of uh, regulars here in the house. Glad you guys are there um, or here. You're not there. You're there, but you're here, but you're also there, but also here or I'm here. All right. Now I've confused myself. We haven't even started yet. <laughs> so good to see you guys. I'm glad you could join us this week for another thrilling episode of LFL. So I hope you guys are all doing good. Say hi in the chat there. If you are joining us at 1 p.m. Pacific time, we are now live and the chat is rolling. If you're joining us anytime after 2 p.m., you're watching the replay and welcome to the replay squad. If you guys are wondering, will this be recorded? Yes, it will. And the replay will be live as soon as as this is over. I'll try not to bubble out of my mouth while I'm talking. Bubbly's good, but not bubbling out of your mouth, apparently. All right, and our friendly moderator in the house is Bruce Bicknell is here this week, and uh, he is going to be fielding all of your issues and drink orders. So go ahead, let him know what you'd like to drink, and he will get those imaginary drinks over to you immediately. All right, so I hope you guys are having fun. If you just joined us, um, that's what we do. We come here every Thursday, 1 p.m., and we just have a little bit of community time, a little bit of fun, and some learning here inside of Photoshop. So we're not all being stupid the entire time. Sometimes there's actually some real education that goes on, which I've got something really good for you guys this week. So anyway, I'm going to pop my glasses on so I can see um, all the little chats and all those kinds of things. Good to see everybody there. All right. Um, do us a favor, um, something I probably don't mention enough. Follow us on the social medias because I go live every Thursday here at 1 p.m. Every Tuesday we drop a new tutorial and usually every Wednesday it goes live on photoshopcafe.com with the written steps. But in between, I'm sharing um, all kinds of short videos. Uh, we're on Twitter. We're on Instagram, we're on Facebook, we're on TikTok at Photoshop Cafe. So make sure you follow us there. Um, tips and artwork, inspiration, but also I've been dropping, you know, like shorts and little quick one minute tutorials and videos. In fact, TikTok and Instagram stories, I've been dropping those every day. So if you don't follow us, do me a favor, open that phone right now, go to Instagram and click on follow and that's Photoshop Cafe. All right, so there's a Facebook group there that Bruce has just clicked, uh, just added there in the link in the chat. And so that's also where we post some of our artwork and we share stuff. And by the way, guys, we're going to be looking at some of your guys' art towards the end of this today. All right, so it looks like everyone's in the house. We've got viewers here. Um, and what we need for you to do is smash that like button. And then we're going to get going. All right. So I'm going to switch over to the desktop right now. And hopefully you guys can see my desktop. So Bruce doesn't have to yell at me. Share your desktop. If my phone starts buzzing, that's usually what it means. I don't even have to look at the phone. I know. Okay. I forgot to share my desktop. That's one of Bruce's main duties is to make sure that I share my desktop. I, I should actually just print it on the wall. Share your desktop. Um, but anyway, 
once again, we're going to jump in and glad you could join us, Sandra. All right, so I have a tutorial I'm going to show you guys in curves and I actually have a little spoiler alert. Um, the reason that I came up with this or that I even decided that it was a good idea is I have a new course coming out. So I've been working very, very hard. I haven't released a course this year yet. So the last one we did was the Photoshop 2022 for digital photographers. So this time I'm doing a shorter course and it's actually almost done on curves. So it's mastering curves inside of Photoshop. And so this is one of the lessons that I'm, I'm actually covering inside here. So I decided to go a little deeper into curves because for those of you who are not familiar with curves, they are one of the most powerful tools inside of Photoshop. You're going to be using curves in Camera Raw. You're going to be using it in Lightroom. You're going to be using it for color correction. You're going to be using it for image adjustments. Uh, if you want to get precise adjustments inside of Photoshop, you're going to be using curves. They also work in other things like uh, color. There's a ton of color stuff you use them for. Um, one of the best color tools in Photoshop. But what it is is understanding how they work. So that's why I... You know, I've been wanting to do that title for a long time. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at this particular image. And in this particular image, I want to do some color. So let's take Lana here and we're going to look at her dress. It's kind of a nice pale blue, which fits the period. If you noticed, each one of these Lanas, these are all Lana, are from different periods. So it was a photo shoot I did a while ago. Um, she put on different outfits, wigs, makeup, and then I shot all of these and then composited them together um, to create this composite. So what we want to do is we want to change the color. So what if I want to take the color from the leggings from futuristic Lana, this brighter blue and change this to exactly the same shade of blue. We're not talking something close, but I'm talking, I want to get that exact blue. All right. And then what I'm going to do is up the ante a little bit after that, because, you know, maybe just changing from one hue to another of the same color, might not be so difficult, but what if we take the purple here from 80s rock Alana and then we apply this to part of the dress as well, but exactly that color. So let me ask you a question. How would you guys do that currently right now? Um, some of you might already know how to do this in curves, uh, but some of you may not. So just think about that for a second. How would you do that? All right, let's go ahead and I'm going to show you how I would do that. And I'm just going to give you the full desktop here and let me zoom in a little bit so we can see this better. All right. So the first thing that I want to do is I want to sample this color. Now, in order to sample the color, what we need to do is get the info palette. So we're going to go into window and we are going to open up the info palette. So for those of you who have never used eyedroppers and all those kinds of things, you're about to learn and it's actually not as hard as you think. Um, at least I'm going to explain it to a way to you that it's actually going to be very simple. All right. So every color inside of Photoshop, every color you see in, when we're working in RGB mode, which is under image mode, is an RGB color, which is red, green, and blue. And if we look in the channels, we have the red, green, and blue channels. And if I select two of them at a time, they will appear in color. So you can kind of see that. So those color channels make up the image. Now, we could be working in CMYK mode and there's other modes. But generally speaking, most of the time we're working in RGB. And if we work in a, a different mode, it would also show here. But every color in this image and as I roll over with my cursor, you can see the colors changing underneath. See how I've got CM, I've got RGB and CMYK. There's a formula. And each one of these colors, say for example, I'm rolling over this uh, reddish kind of a tone there, and you can see it's 146 red, 59 green, and 55 blue. You can see that under the RGB in the info panel. So those three colors together are the formula for that color. Now you can get millions of colors but all of those are a formula and out of each one of those, because we're working with light, which is known as additive color. So when we're working in light, we have a range from zero to 255. So each color channel has a zero to 255, which is 256 levels. So that value can be anywhere between zero and 155 for each color. Now, 128, 
If you did 128, 128, and 128, you'd have a perfectly neutral gray. If you had 255, 255, and 255, you would have a white. Now, why does it start counting at zero? Because I said 256, right? But it stops at 255. It starts counting at zero because 000, zero, zero is black. So it wouldn't start counting at one. It would start counting at zero. Okay, a little bit of theory there. All right, so just bear that in mind when we go ahead and do what we're going to do right now. All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to sample this color. So we're going to grab our color sample tool. We're going to hold down. And see that under the eyedropper, we've got the color sample. And what we're looking for is the blue here in the leggings. Don't go into a highlight area, you know, like here, and don't go into a shadow. Find the diffuse value or the ambient. Well, I guess ambient's not the right color term. The right term is diffuse, which is the real value of that blue. So we're going to click. And then what happens when we use the sampler tool is it locks it into the info palette. So now we know that we've sampled 92, 135, 195. So obviously there's going to be more blue because it's a blue tone. So that is the formula that makes that blue. All right. Don't worry. This is actually not even going to be technical. All right. So I'm just giving you the little technical background because, you know, hey, why not? Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to change the color of this. All right. So we're going to use curves. So let's create a curves adjustment layer. Actually, you know what? We could create a curves adjustment layer, but I'm just going to control J. I want to make a copy of this. And the reason I'm going to do that is I'm just going to apply the curve directly on here. So I'm going to hit control M and this is going to open up our curves dialog box. Now, of course, I could use the adjustment layer and most of the time I would actually, you know what? Why am I not using the adjustment layer? I'm sorry. My apologies, guys. Let's go back and use the adjustment layer because it's the best way to work. I don't know why in my brain I was thinking I wouldn't want to. All right. So what we want to do is we need to add these colors on the curve. So the way to do it is to grab this little picker tool. And then we're going to go over our image and we want to add it here. So I'm going to hold down a keyboard shortcut. I'm going to hold down Command and Shift. Now watch that eyedropper. Notice it goes white. When that eyedropper goes white, it means it's empty. I'm going to fill it with something. I'm going to click. And now it's filled with gray. See that gray appears? That means that I filled it with something. Now, if we go over the curve, notice. Let me pop it out just to make it a little bit easier to see. And this is why my desktop always gets messy, by the way, because I always pop things out. All right. You don't see it there, but it's being added. Well, where is it? Well, if we go under the color channel, we choose the red see that so when you hold down that keyboard short command shift and you click what it does is it samples the colors and adds it to the color channels on the curve so it didn't show under the rgb because it only shows the colors okay so that's great so we see there's our red point now the input is before output is after so we want to change our red to 92 so we go under after and we type in 92. Let's go to the green. All right, so we've got 145 as our before or our in. And the green that we sampled was 135. So we're using a little bit less green. All right. And finally, let's go to our blue channel. So our blue channel, we want to change this to 195. 195. Boom. All right. So we have that color. Problem is right now it's affecting the whole image. So let's select the mask. And what we want to do is we want to invert that mask and hide that adjustment. So control I will invert it and we've hidden that adjustment. Now what we're going to do is we're going to paint it in exactly where we want it. So let's grab a brush. And remember when we're working with a mask, when it's a black mask, it hides the contents of the layer. When we want to show the contents of the layer, we're going to paint with white. So I'm going to turn opacity flow all the way up. And I'm just going to pop open the options here, the brush settings, and make sure everything's turned off. Because I'm using a pen pressure. I'm using a walk-on pen. And I just want to paint fully. I don't want to have to press harder. And watch what happens. As I paint in here, now we get the exact color that we sampled. And now we're changing this dress, or the top part of this dress, to that color. In fact, let's go further. 
get over a little bit. All right. So see that? That's how we get an exact color. Now, that might seem like, okay, you know, but you were just changing the blue. So maybe it's not that difficult. Eh, fair, fair comment, fair comment. All right. So why don't we do something more difficult? Let's grab our sampling tool again. This is our color sample tool. And let's go in and grab this color, which is very different. All right. So let's click and grab that purple there and see that little eyedropper there? The uh, pointer, you can drag that around, by the way, if you're not quite in the right spot. And the nice thing about that is it adds a second sample into our info palette. So there's our blue color still there, but now we have our purple color. All right, let's do the same thing we did before. Let's grab our layer and let's create a curve adjustment. All right, so there's our curve adjustment. And remember what we did before, we want to sample the color. So let's grab that little picker, the little finger, and let's sample the color on her skirt. So we could go into the brighter areas here, or we could go into the darker areas. I'm going to go somewhere in the medium area right there. Notice it's filled with gray. But if we hold down Command Shift, turns white, that's Control Shift on Windows, and click Release. Now you can see it's filled with gray, and it's sampled the colors. All right, let's go under the properties panel. And by the way, if you don't see the properties panel, just double click the curve, it will open it. Or go up under window and find properties. Uh, quite a while ago, a lot of these settings have been unified under the properties panel. All right, so where you see RGB, we're going to choose red. And there's that red point. So um, I noticed because I clicked away, I should not have done that. I deselected it. So we'll just click it to select that point. So if that point is not showing, um, you know, if it's deselected like I had it, you just have to select it. But generally speaking, when I'm working, I don't click away like I did, which is why that selection got lost. All right, so let's go and we're going to change that red to 116. Okay, that's the red. Let's look into the green channel. There's the green. The new green is 40. And let's change the blue channel. The new blue value is 96. And it's good that it stays in the info panel because I have a terrible memory and I would never remember any of that. So I'm glad that that's there. All right, so let's do the same thing here. We're going to invert this mask. Now, here's a little tip. When you do the mask, you want to invert the mask. So either Control-I, Command-I, or click the Invert button. Don't fill it with black. Let me fill it with black and I'll show you what happens. So Command-Backspace, at Control-Backspace, or Control-Delete on Windows, We'll fill it with black. Does the same job, right? But here's a problem. If I resize the image or I um, move things around, see how that edge appears? Because when you fill it with black, it's not the same as inverting it. When you fill a layer mask with black, you're filling the visible area with black. And then you're going to end up with seams. If I hit Control I, I'm physically taking that white mask, inverting it, to a black mask and I can drag as much as I want, you're never going to see the edge because it's now fitting in infinity. So that's an important little tip if you guys didn't know that. Um, definitely worth knowing. All right. So now we're just going to paint with white. So let's grab our brush and let's see what happens. So we're painting on our mask and lo and behold, there's that purple tone right there. Now remember we sampled it from the darker purple, so it might show a little bit darker there. Um, and we can see right there, look at that. And it's just going in here. And because it's working in the RGB channels, and it's this is based on a curve in the color channels, notice it's preserving all the luminosity. And let's go for a little kind of tie-dye kind of look thing here and see how it preserves those colors and the tones underneath and perfectly changes it because it's, um, it's sampling. All right, so I've done pretty messy here. Let me uh, go there. Let's clean it up. So I'm going to grab the uh, background layer, and then we're going to grab our object selection tool. Now, inside of Photoshop 2022, the object finder is busy, and it's looking for the different objects inside of the photo. Deep purple, great band, definitely. Uh, don't feel bad. I have a memory span of a chipmunk. <laughs> chipmunk lately. Thanks, Rod. Um, well, actually, I got to let you guys know. Um, I have a photographic memory. 
but they don't make film for it anymore. Okay, so we've got the object finder and now I can roll over and I see this turns blue. And if I click on that blue, it makes a selection. So let's inverse that selection. Command shift I, control shift I on windows. And now we are selecting everything but our object. And now I can just go into these masks and just click the delete key and hit the delete key on this mask. There we go. Control D cleans up my edges there. And so I don't have to be too perfect on that. And you can see we were able to change those colors before and after. All right. So I do want to mention um, the new course is not out yet. It will be coming out later today. So it's so close. I wanted to get it ready for you guys. Um, but unfortunately, um, I just didn't quite get there. I've almost finished encoding the videos. I've got a couple more videos to encode. I've made a temporary cover. And let me see what you guys think of this. And I actually want to ask you a question about this too. Let me find the, uh, the cover that I created. And I want to ask you guys what you think about the title. So let's go to the desktop here. I'm, I'm just digging through to find to find my files here. I wasn't really planning on probably showing you this yet, but I, I will. Um, let's have a look. So these are some ideas I made. So we have mastering curves in Photoshop 2022, and this would be, or just curves in Photoshop. So what do you guys think? Mastering curves or curves in Photoshop? So the course does go quite deep and, you know, we use eyedroppers and things like that. Um, I explain how curves work. Um, I, I actually give you a little bit of color theory in there. We do dodging and burning with curves. We do all kinds of things. So it is a little bit deeper. So it's not, even though a beginner really can follow along um, and actually, cause it does explain curves in the beginning. So yes, a beginner could follow, but it's got, it goes a little bit deeper where, you know, intermediate users and even some advanced users are going to learn things. So that's kind of where we're at with that. So what do you guys think about the, okay, we see mastering curves, we see curves, mastering curves, mastering curves. Um, but mastering curves is more descriptive mastering curves. Okay. So you guys are voting on it in the chat right now. So it seems like mastering sounds like an in-depth course. Uh, I would leave the word mastering in. Okay. Thank you for that, Warren. Uh, how about learning curves in Photoshop 2022? Zach Model Media. That's a, that's a good suggestion as well. Learning curves. Um, but does learning curve suggest that maybe it's a beginner's title and not an intermediate title? I'm kind of curious. Um, just kind of curious what you guys, um, so that's, that's basically what I'm doing. So I'm creating that. So th this is actually going to be, um, well, it actually, it is, it's actually going to be a premium course on Photoshop cafe. So, you know, as you know, I do <laughs> tutorials. I drop one or two tutorials every week here on YouTube. So I just want to let you guys know that. So I don't even have a link or URL to give you guys because literally it's not even up yet but it will be up later today. So when you're watching the replay, I will put a link into the replay so you guys can check out that course. And you know what I'll do just for you guys, I'm going to create a code uh, right now. So what should I give the code? Um, I don't know, YT for YouTube curves. Um, now let's do LFL curves. LFL curves, okay, so let me just make this big, write this down if you guys are interested. And uh, let me put a outline around it. So exclusively for you guys, I will do a 20% discount. Um, so you guys can get this before it's not going out to the newsletter or anything like that. So if you guys do decide it's something to interest you and you see it later on today when I put it live, LFL curves, and that will give you 20% off. How does that sound? All right, so let's continue here. And uh, you know, another thing that I thought I just wanted to quickly talk about before we jump into some other kind of fun stuff is let me just close these out. Why do I set up my desktop the way I do? This is uh, something that, you know, I do get asked from people quite a bit sometimes. 
So, and uh, thank you for keep adding those suggestions. They've got mastering curves, learning curves, curves. And I'm going to look at what you guys vote on. And, uh, and that's actually what I'm going to call it is what you guys vote. So you get to decide what it's called. How's that? All right. So my workspace. You know, if you've noticed, I work with a very, very minimal workspace. You know, you know how many panels there are in Photoshop? There's a ton of panels. If I just go reset and we just do the... Um, let's do the essentials and by the way to choose a workspace just go under the workspaces there and you can select I'll show you how to create a custom workspace and then I'm gonna hit reset essentials so you can open it up there and then you hit reset and I'll take it back to the factory settings so this is the panels that come with Photoshop you know when you first open it so you got properties adjustments libraries swashes gradients patterns you know Definitely useful layers, channels, and paths. Now, why do I work with such a minimum amount of tools? And the reason for that is I can replace so many of these. You know, I just, you know, I could go through almost every single one of these and tell you why I don't have it by default. So let's take the navigator panel, for example. So the navigator panel is there, and, and this is great because it enables you to zoom into the picture and you can move around. Right. So, you know, you guys, maybe you use it, maybe you don't. So here's the thing. I close that panel because I don't need it. I can option click and I can drag in. I can hit the space bar. I can move around or I can use the bird's eye view, which is literally, you know, we can zoom in and out that way. It's actually been a while since I've done <laughs> the bird's eye view. But, um, you know, so we can do these, you know, just by scroll dragging all these different things here, space bar, you know, just dragging it around. So I don't really feel like I need that panel because I can do that manually. All right. So then with the colors, color swashes, sometimes I do open the colors panel. Uh, but the thing is, you know, when I need a color, I can just click here and I can select a color from the color picker. So that's another piece of clutter that just, if I need it, I can get it from under here. And sometimes I do grab these, you know, patterns, gradients, and swashes. Yeah, those are useful, but I don't use those all the time. So I close those down. And then even when it comes to the type, you know, like right now where we've got adjustment lights. Okay, so adjustments. Adjustments could be useful, right? But I can grab them from down here. And I can grab the adjustments from there. So I, I don't really need those anymore. Uh, histogram can be in use, but you know, a lot of the time I use it at a different point. So what's this one? Commenting, you know, it's a new feature. Don't be showing it off. That's why they're showing it. Okay, history. History could be useful, but control Z, I can undo that multiple times, you know, and command shift Z will redo. So, you know, I don't really need that open all the time either. Libraries, I do use quite a bit. So I pop it down here though, because I want to minimize it. And then I'm just going to click there. So the library's there. And usually the brushes, I'll put in there as well. Now, a lot of the other panels, like the type tools, you don't need because the properties panel. Now, I'm not sure if you guys knew something here, but in the properties panel, it pretty much replicates everything in the type panel now. So if I grab the type tool, and I go under there, all these settings here are pretty much duplicated now inside the properties panel. So most of the time I have layers, channels, paths, and properties, and that's it. Now the properties panel also has additional things. I don't know if you guys knew, but if you want to work in things like frames and shapes, and I think somebody, let me go here. I'm going to drop something here and convert it to frame because I think Rod Shelley was working with frames and he had an issue with these frames. I'm going to create this and um, and one of the things he had with this is that um, let's do a frame from layers. So this that's a frame. All right. So when you're working with different things, uh, I think he was doing type and he was dropping his type in here. And then what was happening is he was working on his type and it was snapping. Was it the type rod? Was it Rod Shelley? Just uh, let, let us know there in the in the chat there, or maybe it was something else he was working at, and they kept popping into the frame, and he was kind of concerned about that. 
let me duplicate this make it smaller and uh, I'm just gonna give you a little tip here so you know he was working here and then for some reason I think this keep kept popping into his frame or something like that I, I don't know um, let me see his right there Rod Shelley oh frames drive me nuts okay so what I wanted to show you is uh, I'm not sure if you're aware of this but if your things keep appearing you know jumping into frames and stuff like that and you don't want them to and I guess you would go that way there we go um, what you got to do is if you look under the locking options I don't know if you guys realize but they added an option here under locking which prevents auto nesting into and out of artboards and frames if I turn that on and then I lock that nesting the images whatever's on that layer it could be type it could be images whatever it is it will not go into that frame now so if you want to protect it you can do everything else to it like you normally would but if you turn on that option there that'll prevent it going into frames all right so I just wanted to uh, just kind of show that now working on the workspaces once again so I go down to this very minimum workspace and then when I want to save it I just go under here and then I just choose new workspace and uh, of course, you know, I call it Colin Minimum, which I don't need to do. I can reset it any time because I've already created it. But if I go to Colin Minimum, it'll show how I used it last time. And if I want to reset that, that will reset it to how I saved it. And then I just have these minimal panels. Uh, so I just have the maximum area for working with. Now, the panels are useful. But once again, there's so many things you can do in a lot of these panels that you don't really need the panel to do it so much anymore because we've got the content sensitive properties panel now and uh, and a lot can be done with keyboard shortcuts. So, you know, I just wanted to just throw that out there. If you guys like lots of panels everywhere, that's great. I even have a second monitor and I put them on there, but I just wanted to mention, uh, you know, that's something working with those workspaces. Do you guys use workspaces? Um, curious, let me know. And let's close this out. And um, and this will just kind of take us back. And you can see there's some of the files I've been working on with this. Um, these are all the files I've been working with this curves course. It's kind of fun. All right. But what I'm going to do is I'm just going to click on the PS. And this will take me back to Photoshop. Because what we're going to do right now is we're going to do something we haven't done in a while. And yes, Fix My Photo. So you guys have been asking for another episode of Fix My Photo, and that's exactly what we're going to do right now. So we're going to be looking at some of the photos that you have submitted, and, uh, and I've got these here inside of Lightroom. I'm going to bring them onto my main monitor, and we'll bring, bring it through in a second, and we'll see what we've got here. Now, just before I do, if you guys want to submit your own photos for us to work on live here, what you want to do is submit them to fixmyphoto.net. If fixmyphoto.net does not work for some strange reason, let me give you another link. I'm not sure if you have the direct link there, Bruce, but let me get it for you. Um, and I'm going here and I'm going to give you the direct link. So I'm posting this in to the chat. All right, so there's the link there. That's the direct link. And then you could upload up to three photos a week. Uh, I prefer raw files. Make sure you put your name in the file name. And then we know who submitted them. And then that way, of course, you know, I can give you credit and shout out and all that fun stuff. All right, let's go to the desktop. Oh, I don't know how long that water's been sitting there. That tasted a little weird. All right, so if I faint, guys, um, it's because I was I just drank poison water. All right, so let's have a look here. So we've got some images that have been submitted this week here. It looks like Sandra. Um, nice one here. And uh, looks like you've got some nice warm weather there, Sandra. And Stuart Braithwaite. Oh, I like that window. That's kind of cool. Uh, Mike. Don Haynes. Rod Shelley. Thomas. Um, and we used this one in our last one. Okay, so let's go back 
And let's see what we've got here. Why don't we start with Sandra's one? I'm going to guess that um, this is Orchipest, I believe. Um, and if you are here, let us know. All right. Uh, Bernie says, glad to see us back. And Tracy's, woo. So you guys are glad to see this. Okay, so this is a great image. I like this image. It looks, you know, it's a cool bridge. Is this like Boston or somewhere? Forgive me if I did not know or I got that wrong. But I, I, I know there's a cool bridge like this. I think it's in Boston. All right. So the challenge I'm going to guess with this is going to be the noise. Because this is shot at ISO 6400 shot ARW, I believe that's a Sony camera, and uh, 37 mil, f4.5, and 1 125th of a second. Okay, so you put this on a tripod, I'm going to guess, kept it pretty stable, opened it up, could have opened it maybe a little more, but you wanted to have a little bit of depth of field in here, and then we've got some noise going on here. Montreal, okay, thank you for that. I'm um, sorry I was uh, wrong. All right, so if we look at this, we can see that there's noise. Now, this happens when we shoot at a higher ISO. So we can, there's a lot of tricks for reducing noise. And uh, honestly, I believe the one inside of Camera Raw and Lightroom is the best way to remove noise, unless you're using like a Nick plugin, which actually works even better. But the, um, for a long time, you know, we really struggle with getting rid of noise on here. No tripod. Well, look at you. All right. Very, very well done to hold it steady at that. I mean, it's pretty wide though, 37, but still one, one twenty-fifth, of, one twenty-fifth of a second. It's a pretty slow shutter speed to hold that steady. Or maybe were you leaning against something? Maybe steady hand. I've no head for years. Well, well done. I'm, I'm impressed. All right. So anyway, the tools that we would use for this is go to the develop module. Now we'll do this in Lightroom because the setting inside of Lightroom is identical to the setting that we'd be using inside of Camera Raw. In fact, the develop module is identical. All right, so let's go down. And what we're looking for here is detail. So there's two different types of noise we can have. By default, it does a little color noise reduction. And yeah, there's that color noise. Let me show you. So we zoom in here. So the color noise here is, see the little colored speckles we get? So there's two types of noises, color and then luminance. Luminance is that the green structure itself. So color, what we want to do is just roll this off until, there we go, right there. So that's the unified, it unified all that. Let me just go back a little bit. I want to do the very minimum. Okay, right there is where it's, about where it's happening is about nine. Oh, by the way, if you're working in here and it looks like that, See how long those sliders are? Just a little tip here. Drag the interface, drag it out as far as you can, and see how it elongates the sliders? It doesn't make them work stronger, but what it does is it allows you to make more precise adjustments because you can, uh, you know, you've got longer sliders to work with. So that's one of the things I always do with the develop module. And the nice thing is it remembers that between module to module. See that each module will remember so if I go to the library and then back to develop, it's sticky. It remembers. All right, so good. All right, so we've reduced that amount of noise. So as we're going over here, you're going to notice that the highlights usually don't get a noise as much as the shadows. And because this is a night shot, we're really going to be dealing with some noise here. All right, so what I would do is I would go, once I've got the color noise done, let's go to the luminance and see what we can do to roll this back a little bit. There we go. And, you know, you don't have to completely remove it. You just want to take it back to a level that is uh, a little less. So that's 39. So notice you can see that noise even when we zoomed out. And then we zoom in here. You can see it a little less. Oh, it looks like there's a little spot there. Let me just, uh, oh, we'll come back to the spot in a second. All right, so we're reducing that noise a little bit. And let's zoom back in. And 200% is very excessive. We could probably go to 100% and do this so let's take the noise back and let's roll it so we can get a significant reduction now you could go perfectly smooth but as you know look at this it starts to look cartoony so you've got to find a balance in here so i'm going to take this just a little too far just a little bit and then we can bring our detail so if we take this back watch these areas of detail here let's bring it up a little bit 
so as we increase the detail see how it brings back the structure of the image okay so let's bring that back to just where it's starting to kick and i'm going to give it here and by the way if you hold down the alt or the option key it turns it into a grayscale so see how there the detail looks soft and as we bring it see how it starts to kick i'm looking at this particular area right here so holding down that alt or the option key will get rid of that uh, color so you're not distracted all right and then the next one is contrast once again holding down the alt or the option key look at this see how that contrast comes back now be careful if i go too far see how it starts to add that noise of course it's not as bad as the grain it starts to look a little bit rather than noise more like film grain but let's bring it back to just the point where it's starting to to hit and uh and i might even just give just pull back just a tiny tiny little bit there and a tiny little bit in contrast and maybe give the luminance just a little bit more kick. All right, so if we look at that, yeah, let's give it a, maybe even pull that detail back just a little bit. So what it is, is a balancing act. So what we're looking for is to protect the image. Um, we don't want it to look cartoony, but we want to reduce the amount of noise. So if we hit the backslash key, we can see the before and the after. Hard to see here. Let's go to 100%. And uh, if we go to 100%, you can see there it is before all that noise and then after we're preserving a lot of our detail um, but we are reducing a lot of that noise now of course you can push that luminance harder if you want but just be careful uh, the goal here is not necessarily to eliminate the noise but just remove it enough where it's not a distraction and we're not losing any um, any of the detail in the image because once again we don't want it to look cartoony you know that's not what we want all right and I did mention something about um, I, I see a little spot there it's probably a you know a little bokeh or something like that so we can find these kind of things very easily if we go to the healing brush we want to turn on our little healing tool here our little brush tool see that so we've got our spot removal and we've got you know different tools here we've got our you know we can add these masks and things like that but let's grab our spot removal tool and what i want to do is go here and let's make it a little bit bigger i don't know if you guys can see that little circle there but i can definitely see that so you can change the size of this and you can do different things with it but let's go over that area there and just click and drag that up and see what we're doing we're just kind of removing that and uh, if we go before and after maybe even make that a little bit bigger so I'm going to undo it, undo it a couple of times, and let's make it bigger. The right bracket key will make this bigger, and we're just going to click there. Now, here's another tip. See how I moved the sample point? If you don't like the sample point, and this one actually looks a lot better, but before it went down into the horizon, it didn't look good. Here's a tip. Forward slash key will just randomly keep moving this to different points in the photo until you find one that looks a lot better. And, uh, and then we can see right there, that's looking good. Great. All right, let's go back to the library here. And thank you for submitting that, Sandra. Um, I like this image. And, you know, I, I kind of like the, the coloring here. I mean, we could change the coloring if we want, but I, I personally, I like it. If you wanted to neutralize it, uh, let me show you something here. I'm just going to edit in Photoshop just for fun. Uh, actually, why don't we open this in Photoshop? So we're going to choose. I feel like my interface is looking a little weird. Hang on a sec. Let me Alt or Option Zoom. There we go. All right. So yeah, let's edit this in Photoshop. So we're bringing it in now. And I just want to show you something fun. You know, since we were talking about curves earlier, if you want to neutralize this, we can do it with curves. Of course, we can do it in Lightroom as well. But I know. David Holstock doesn't like Lightroom. Are you there, David? <laughs> it's always fun to rag on you guys. It's all right. Okay, so oh, it looks like there's a little color pollution here too. Why don't we get rid of that? All right, so what we're going to do, I'll show you how to do that in a sec. But first of all, let's go in here. I'm going to create a curves adjustment layer. Now, in the curves adjustment layer, we have an auto setting. Now, we can change the parameters for this auto setting. 
And uh, let's do that right now. So what we want to do is go to the preferences and as the auto options. And if we look at these auto options, we can choose to enhance monochromatic per channel. By the way, monochromatic gives a smoother, less, um, and it will protect the existing colors per channel will give it much more dramatic and it will shift the colors. But here's the thing. If I choose that and I choose snap neutral gray tones, we can go in here and it will attempt to do uh, the color correction in here by just kind of going through there. Now, here's another way to do color correction. If I want to neutralize something, we grab that gray eyedropper and then we click and that will neutralize that area. Whoa, that's a little excessive. Uh, let me just go here and undo that. Okay, so as you can see there, uh, let me reset it. And once again, we just grab that. And if we wanted to neutralize with that area, that's going pretty extreme, but we just click in the different areas and uh, that's how you would do it. So let's go here. Why is that going suddenly so extreme? Ah, I grabbed the white one. Okay, we can grab here. Whoa, that just suddenly went soft, didn't it? There we go. All right, so you can do that, or you know, you can choose to click on different parts of the image. Let me undo that. And if you click here, you can neutralize that to gray. But what you want to do when you neutralize it really is you're looking for an area that would be normally just a, a gray. I think the auto is on. That's why it was doing all that. And you could do it. But let's have a look at fixing this here. So I'm, I'm seeing that little color pollution. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a new layer and I'm going to put this layer into color blend mode. So what's going to happen now is the color is going to change. It's going to preserve the luminosity. So let's grab a brush. And with this brush selected, I want to paint. I'm going to sample here. Alter option and let's sample this bluish tone. Maybe we want that to be our color. And then all I need to do is just like literally just paint. See that? I'll make the brush a little bit smaller. And this is what I'll do if I want to fix, you know, some kind of a split lighting. And I want to unify that lighting a bit more. You could just go that way and just literally all we're doing is just changing the color and we can fix it. Let's go here, sample that. Now I'm, you know, I should be using selections and stuff to help me be more precise, but this is, you know, I just want to do this quickly and that's how you do it. Just alter option and then paint. And then we can get rid of the color pollution in here and just kind of unify these, these colors a little bit more. Even areas like that, if you want to even those out, that's essentially how I would do that. So hopefully that was useful. All right, let's move on and look at some other images. Now, if you guys have any questions when I'm doing these, this is definitely the time to throw those questions out there. Um, no, it's supposed to be green. All right, okay. We know it's supposed to be green, so we will not change those from green. Thank you for that. No, no. No. All right. So we will not change those from green. But if you are wanting to fix the light pollution or color pollution, that's how you would do it. OK, so we will just to keep Orchipest happy. Hang on. Let's go. Let's delete that. And then we go back to the green. There we go. All right. Whew. All right. <laughs> and now she's smiling. All right. Great. OK, so let's go to the um, let's have a look here and see what Stuart Stuart Braithwaite has given us. I just love this. Why does that remind me of Led Zeppelin? What's a Led Zeppelin album cover I'm thinking of right now um, that reminds me of? Led Zeppelin um, albums. Let's do the albums. And there we go. Maybe it's not exactly that, but Led Zepp 4. I see that, and I see that shape, and it just makes me think of that, you know. So I'm showing my age, but I bet you a lot of you guys like Led Zeppelin as well. So I'm not alone. All right. So why don't we open this into Camera Raw. Um, we're going to open this as a smart object in Photoshop. I could do it here in Lightroom. It's the same. But if I double click, this will take me into Camera Raw. And we'll do this just, just for fun. All right. So why don't we get some comments there, Led Zeppelin. House of the Holy. Makes me think of... Uh, uh, that's the cool thing about Photoshop. You can go back. Yes, absolutely. Very nice window. Yeah, I think it's a cool window.
Now, let's have a look here. Um, looks like the focus is way back there. So let's just do some things with the tonality. Um, you know, I may not share your artistic vision on this one, Stuart, so please allow me to make some, um, you know, take a little liberty on this. All right, so I'm going to keep the blues. In fact, I'm going to enhance those blues because I like them. Uh, the exposure, I'm going to hold down the Alt or the Option key and I'm going to move it up till we see clipping. Okay, so that's about where it's clipping. Let's bring it back. I am going to recover the highlight detail, open up the shadows a little bit. Give it white to pop it a little bit. Let's bring the exposure back. Let's do the blacks. All right. So we're just kind of giving that, you know, a little bit more punch here. So that's a good place to start. I want to give this a bunch of texture because I like this texture. So I'm just going to give it some, some heavy texture here. Um, I'm going to use a little touch of dehaze just to make the texture. Watch what happens. See this kind of pattern or the texture on here dehaze is going to really look at that just brings it out right so you could use the clarity i know a lot of people use clarity but see the thing i don't like about clarity is see how it adds these black around it tends to blacken things it adds halos around things so i prefer dehaze because it doesn't do that as much and then when you apply the dehaze then i like to take the blacks and pull those back a little bit because dehaze adds black when it adds that contrast all right so we're giving this a little bit of punch Let's reduce the saturation. And I'm going to punch up the vibrance. And then what that's going to do is it's going to bring out the more secondary colors. Because if you guys didn't know the difference between saturation and vibrance, is double click to reset. Saturation goes across the board. There's no color. Increases the color evenly. Vibrance, on the other hand, if I reduce it, see how the colors that were saturated maintain some of their color. Whereas the desaturated colors move more. And same thing when I go here. It won't push the saturation too high on certain colors, but allows the other ones to come through. But a combination of vibrance and saturation is too much. So what I like to do is take the saturation down, push the vibrance up, and then it boosts the more subtle colors and gives us, see, that's how the reds and kind of different colors can come through here. So this is kind of fun here, you know, before or after we're getting kind of almost like a little painterly kind of look going on here i do want to pop the brightness just a little bit more and protect the highlights so we don't get whites in there so i'm bringing out this texture and now we're going to click ok and we're going to apply this inside of photoshop now one of the problems i see here is we've got camera shake so i'm going to control j and um i'm going to try something it's not a feature that I use very often, but it's a useful filter and that's the blur. And we are going to do the, actually it's under sharpen. Under sharpen, do I need to rasterize it? No. Hang on, there we go. Shake reduction. So we're going to use the camera shake reduction on this. And then what happens is Photoshop, there we go. Photoshop looks at this, it analyzes it. And then it says, hey, let's reduce the shake. And look at that, does it there. So we can do artifact suppression if we want, and this will get rid of the artifacts. So that actually smoothens it out a little bit. And the smoothing. So if we take this down, there's no smoothing, and we turn this up, there's a lot of smoothing. See that? Makes it a little blurry again. We don't want that. So let's go here. I'm going to bring this down. And so what we're doing here is we're doing the camera shake reduction. This is one of the times I would use this. It's not something I use a lot. And if you want to, you can actually manually go in there and do it. But let's click here and apply it. So this is what we had before. And this is what we have after. Now, if it feels a little strong, let's put this into overlay mode. And then I'm going to take this down a little bit. And I'm going to blend the two together. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to command shift U, uh, sorry, command option shift, command U shift and E. We're going to pop this to a new layer and we'll put this into overlay blending mode. And then we're going to do high pass sharpening. So we go filter other and then we go to high pass. And notice when we do this, now what it does is it just puts the colors back to how they were. There's no sharpening. And now we're going to go up here and do the high sharpening. Now, well, the high pass sharpening does a great job of just doing that final bit of sharpening in here. So if we look at that before 
and after you can see it does a good job now if we go with the original let's see how the high pass did and that's actually quite nice I'm going to go with this so what I did is I actually created the high pass sharpen with a combination of the two layers but I'm not going to use the top layer with the shake reduction anymore I'm just going to use that shake reduction outline for the high pass sharpen and then that reduces the amount of halos in here and gives us a, a more you know just kind of a, a better kind of a look there if you want to include that one you can and maybe just you know dial it in a little bit but i feel see that it just feels like a little much so yeah let's just go with that and then we've got something that's kind of sharpened and it's kind of fun now another thing we could do to this is we could apply a gradient map so let's go under the adjustment layers and we're going to choose a gradient map so with the gradient map what i want to do is i'm going to change the blend mode to color so now the gradient map is only going to affect the color and let's go under the photographic toning under legacy gradients we're going to grab photographic toning and let's see what we can do with some different colors in here so we're just kind of clicking on these and seeing how these look and never hurts to you know audition other colors just to see what it looks like so you see the variety we can get here i kind of like this one now it's too strong so we can take the opacity all the way down so we're looking at the original color and then what i'm going to do is just blend a little bit of our new color in with it and it's just going to kind of shift those hues to something a little bit more interesting now another thing i feel like i want to do with the gradient is let's just apply a gradient adjustment right over the top we're just going to slap this gradient fill right over the top here top to bottom and this is another kind of fun thing to do is when we kick this into color blend mode we can do these kind of gradient blends i'll bring that down a little bit and it just gives another variety i don't know just kind of having some fun here playing around with that texture so anyway just kind of having a little fun with these uh this week so we did something a little practical and then we did something a little bit more artistic here you know some people might even add a little grain on top of this if they wanted to you know just go for a, you know something else you know for another kind of an effect there's a lot of things we could do but um you know i like this window and i just wanted to just kind of play it up a little bit all right so one of the things I want to show you guys right now that I did mention that we're going to do is we are going to have a look at what you guys submitted. And by the way, don't forget to upload your photos to fix my photo. And we'll try to do this a little bit more consistent. Pardon me. And right now, let me get in here and I'm going to find your guys photos. So we're going to go fix my photo. You can see my desktop. I'm just going to hide it. It's a mess. I know. I know it's a mess. All right, so let's go here and we're going to go for the LFL. Um, uh, live from lockdown, here we go. And let's look under here and we're going under here. Can you guys believe we've got 20 weeks of you showing your pictures in our Facebook group? So this is the Photoshop Cafe Facebook group. Um, guys, don't forget to check it out. Join that group and then you can post your pictures and each week i'm going to go through and highlight my favorites for the week all right so we're starting here with red saunders red saunders tried something different i love this eclipse here it's very very cool and it looks like this is composited in here we got a little cauldron going on it's kind of fun and it looks like you stretched the people i don't know if that was intentional and by the way if i show you this and you guys are here um let us know hey it's me and then i'll give you a shout out here when we're doing your your pictures i like what you've done but i feel like you stretch the people a little bit they seem elongated um maybe that's on purpose because um you know for whatever reason uh, so i'm not going to assume that they're not supposed to be stretched but just be aware when you do that if you were doing a kind of a you know like a scene like maybe that you were drugged or something um make sure the other elements such as this eclipse are also stretched and then that will make things look a little more realistic all right so let's go in here so this is angel art i think this is just cool i love what you did particularly with the hair we've got composite here some fun things here some birds a different you know kind of abstract surrealistic kind of a image um i like the cleanness of this even though someone you know mentioned uh, linda too many things in there 
it's still clean looking to me. Um, you know, the tones are unified. Uh, you know, that's the important thing, right? The colors, the tones all work harmoniously together. So even though there's a lot going here, it doesn't feel overly busy, busy to me. Um, angel art is funky. So, uh, photo maker. All right, let's continue. Okay. So this one here, Andrew Nichols, are you here? Andrew Nichols. I love this. So you've got this cool composite here, and this is desktop photography as a model, I believe of the lighthouse and everything like that. And these are put together. Um, and I'll show you because there's the before and after. So here we go. Look at this, the little lighthouse here with some sand and then these were put together like this nice job i like how you've done that how you've done the light headlights coming out of the car lighthouse and everything like that good job i would say maybe the lights on the lighthouse here are a little bit saturated but you know hey who am i to criticize i think it looks great and then we've got nirmala nirm nirmalaya nirmalaya Am I saying your name right? I apologize if I'm not. Um, but I, I love the design that you come up with. Happy Women's Day. Whenever there's a special day, um, he always puts, or I believe he always does a design and drops it into the group. And I just love his sense of design. Happy Women's Day. Not until every March for every day. It's just nicely done. Uh, clean. Nice work. Good quality. Love it. All right. Andrew. Andrew again. Well, two for Andrew this week. And I love this. Uh, behind the look of a model, built from stock images over two days. Yeah, I can definitely tell a lot of work has gone into this. Uh, this is great. And I love this. So we've got all the, you know, the hair crimping and the makeup and the, all the, you know, basically hair and makeup. Everything that goes into a model shoot is there behind us. So it's like this trail of, okay, here I am. And this is what took to get here um nice job i like that composite looks good okapis says well i agree this one really um tracy says it speaks to her yeah really pops i love this good job nicely nicely composited and um and then we've got hana what is a share our pictures without hana um so hana thank you for this one seriously one bite wasn't enough so that's funny i believe that's this is god and this is an homage to adam and eve and she's got a whole thing of uh apples and then he's like you know trying to hang on there for dear life and this is giving me vertigo looking down on there that's that's a long way down um i like your conceptual art and good job of this i think this is great uh once again uh john william bell i don't know if you're in the house here the sorceress Please click on the image to see the whole thing. Um, I don't know why if I go bigger, is that going to make it bigger? No. For some reason, I'd like to make that bigger. But, uh, you know, that's that's what we've got. We've got this tiny little image here, but um, looks great. Nice job. And uh, Anita Hampton. This might actually be my favorite submission of the week. I don't know if you're here, Anita. But uh, this is a really great underwater composite. Um, I love how you got the mermaids here, the seahorse, which is a unicorn. We've got the, uh, you know, the man of war, a jellyfish, everything going on here. And we've got the underwater. And uh, I like how you're doing the warping here to show that we've got a little bit of water. And uh, I think that looks good. Somebody did mention in here, it'd be nice to add a few bubbles. I think, yeah, that would have been, um, would have been nice. Um, and this kind of feels a little homage to the image that would, um, oh, you're here, Anita. Well, congratulations. Thank you for this. And I don't know, was this inspired by the, um, obviously this is a completely different image, but the wallpaper that was in Photoshop, um, a couple of versions ago, there was an underwater. I don't know if that inspired you. Um, I'm definitely not saying it's a copy because this is its own unique image completely. Um, good job. Thank you for sharing this. And yes, very talented. Um, what else we got here? And uh, I guess that's it for those images for this week. So, um, you know, one of the things I just wanted to talk about, because I'm going to get people asking me about this. Um, no, but the library background image was. Um, all right, good job. So people are going to ask me about this. So just in closing, um, 
I've already got people, you know, the Apple Studio, Apple Studio, they announced, was it yesterday? Everyone, everyone asking me about the configurations, I, I, because I guess I've done a lot of reviews on these Macs and the M1s and all that kind of fun stuff. So what is my thoughts on this? I think it's an amazing beast. I would call this a Mac Mini Pro. Um, I haven't ordered one because I have a Mac Pro and... Um, I'm going to wait and see what they do for the Pro. Let me just get my little little face on here too. So, hey. And uh, and the reason I'm going to wait for the Mac Pro is because I already have a Mac Pro. And I'm wondering if they're going to make it, you know, because it's upgradable. Maybe they're going to give us a card or something that I can put in my Mac Pro to upgrade it to the M1. My guess, and, and that was at the end of the Apple thing, they said the Mac Pro is the last one. It's, it's, an, it's for another day. My guess is going to do quad core. Okay, so what is this? So um, I'm just going to go into order now so we can look straight into the prices. So the Mac Studio is using the M1 Max. So you can go to the M1 Max up to 32, and I believe it goes up to the uh, 64 gigs, which is what I have on my laptop. And so for a lot of people, this would be enough. Now the base model here, here's the problem with um, the particularly M1 max is because they're doing the system on a chip which means they're not upgradable you can't upgrade the ram and things like that later on so if i choose select this will give us the pricing and this is where we can look at these upgrades and i'm going to tell you what upgrades i think are worth getting so the system on a chip right so right now we've got this m1 max with 10 core um, we've got 24 core gpu uh, for 200 dollars, i would definitely go to a 32 core gpu um, unless you're feeling spendy, I would not go to the 1200. I would stay here. This is this is what I would do um, if we're looking for a more budget system. Best bang for the buck. So the $200 to go 24 to 32 is well worth it for the GPU because that's where a lot of the work happens in a graphics unit. Then the other one to go to 32 to 64, double it for $400. I would definitely do that. I would not even consider not doing that because it's not just RAM, right? So when we're doing these system on a chips, the, you know, the M1s. RAM is just basically like a bus station. Everybody comes in there, and then while it's in RAM, it does the processing uh, with the CPU. So, so it goes into the RAM, you know, like RAM does not speed up a computer. Not having enough RAM will slow it down. So kind of like, you know, the port of LA. The ships come in, they come out, that's the RAM, the ships park, and then the CPU is unloading those ships. Now, if it gets full and now ships are waiting, yeah, now it's slowing it down. But adding more ports, if you don't have enough ships, is not going to speed it up. So RAM gives you the capacity to use larger files and to run more programs at once. But the thing is, this is not memory. When we talk about the memory here, it's unified memory. It's not RAM. It's also GPU. So the graphics processor is also using it. So I would do that. So the very minimum one here would be $25.99. Now, if you are education, I would go to the education store in Apple and that probably save you like two or $300. All right. So for this configuration, this is what I would recommend. Bang for the buck. Oh, I'd probably kick up that SSD because one terabyte would be nice. I'm not going to do two, four, or eight terabyte. It's a lot of money um, for stuff that I can do with external drives. In fact, I've got these great little external drives here. Um, where is it? That I'm using SanDisk NVMe external drives. Not very expensive. Um, so, yeah, I would I would not do that now. Let's go back and let's look at the second option here. If you were going to go for the Beast, for the M1 Ultra, which is essentially two Maxes slapped together. Now we're getting into some serious performance. By the way, the previous one I showed you, that is going to be very good for anybody using Photoshop or anything like that. Most of that is going to work well and you're going to get great performance. If you're feeling more spendy and you're doing video, um, 3D, things like that, you're going to want to jump into the... 20 core, 48 core GPU, blah, blah, blah. But let's go and select and let's look at what I would recommend for these. So, system on a chip, a 48 core, 264 core GPU for $1,000. If you're rich, go ahead and do it. Um, otherwise, I would just skip on that step and I would rather spend $800 and double from 64 to 128 gigs of unified memory. This is going to be a beast with that memory you'll get much more out of that 
then you will be upgrading that the cores in the GPU, in my opinion. Um, once again, it hasn't been tested yet. You know, I don't know anybody that has one, so it needs to be tested. But this is definitely, a, you know, expensive for a little bit. This way, you're definitely getting a bang for your buck. And I'm not even going to increase this. Like, imagine this. If you had a choice between going from a 1 to a 4 terabyte SSD or going to more cores or going to more RAM, the RAM is a no-brainer or the memory. So I would do that. And at this point, you're looking at 47.99 plus tax and all that kind of stuff. So that's my thoughts. Um, and I'm just sharing those thoughts. I know not everybody's into that. What is a neural engine? Neural engine is for AI. So um, it, it actually has the AI built in. So for things like when you're working with Photoshop and you've got the AI filters, those are going to run faster if you've got the neural core. Um, and it also does, you know, anything that uses artificial intelligence is going to use that and it's going to speed it up substantially. So um, all the... Uh, these come with those. They come with different cores. There's a high efficiency core. The efficiency core enables it to run um, very, very low power consumption and it doesn't get hot, stays cool. Then there's a the performance cores which kick in when you're doing things like the um, rendering, encoding, things like that. Uh, the GPU core is when you're doing stuff on GPU. So a lot of stuff inside of Photoshop is moving to the GPU. Certain filters, oil paint filter, um, Lightroom, um, Lightroom, Lightroom is using a lot of GPU. Lightroom Classic is still using a lot of CPU, although things are shifting to the GPU. So that's what those do. The Lightroom um, is actually a hog when it comes to CPU. So they've got a lot of work to do. Just run your system monitor when you see that running. And I've done reviews on some of these M1s. So check out those reviews at Photoshop Cafe and where I've actually also show you guys the speed. So I've done speed comparisons. And so these chips are gonna be very similar to that performance until you get into the new one, which is what they announced, which is the Max, uh, not the Max, the Ultra. The Ultra is basically two of those Maxes. So the Max that's in here is the same Max in the laptop. All right, so I said a lot about that, but I just wanted to throw that out there because people ask me about these, getting a lot of messages. What do you guys recommend? Um, and I just wanted to just throw it out there. That's how I would spend my money if I was doing it. All right. So anyway, guys, thanks for joining us. It's been great. It's been a wonderful week. Do me a favor. Hit that like button. That's the thumbs up there. Um, it helps with the YouTube algorithm. If you haven't yet subscribed to Photoshop Cafe, hit the subscribe button. Turn on notifications. That's that little bell. And then you'll see that little red will appear next to us when we are live. So you'll know when we're live and you'll get some notifications. If you want to get notifications really in your email before we go live, Go to photoshopcafe.com. There's a link there um, in the description, actually, of this video. So when it goes live in the replay, click on that link. Subscribe to that part of the mailing list. It's separate than the mailing list. If you're on the main mailing list, you'll get our weekly newsletter um, with the free tutorial and stuff like that. But when we go live, I don't send out those notifications to everybody. Those notifications go to people on that special list, which is pretty much all of you. So join that list if you want to get an email, and that'll come out about 10, 15 minutes before we go live as a reminder. <sighs> all right, all that out of my, I should just make a recording and just play all that as a recording, right? What do you guys think? <laughs> all right, John, I'll see you next week. I will see everyone, Tracy, Rod Shelley, Odgear, Hannah, Jeffrey, everybody. So um, thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week with another fun, thrilling episode. And what I got to do is I got to get busy now because I've got to finish up our curves course and push that live so that'll be live in uh, maybe a couple of hours all right thanks guys till next week see you at the cafe